Hello, I'm Pam Hoffman, Everyday Spacer. <laughs> what? Oh, I'm Jeff Miller, 2049 Outfitters. It says so right there, and that's who I am. <laughs> At Everyday Spacer, we show regular folks how to personally and directly participate in space exploration, science, and astronomy. We're here on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 midnight Eastern Time, and 2 p.m. on Saturday in Queensland, Australia. We're broadcasting live from Thousand Oaks, California. A lot has happened since last Friday, and it's been pretty unsettling. Thank you for being here with us in spite of everything. If you like this video, please subscribe and hit the like button. Thank you. Oh, and Janie just came in. Oh, hi, oh, Janie. Cliff was already here. Yeah, um, we so talked to him before. Friday the 13th. Yep, my lucky day. Yep. <laughs> I figure since it's unlucky for everyone else, the luck has to go somewhere, so I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. um, and Cliff was here early. <laughs> hi, Cliff. Hi, Cliff. Thanks so much for being here with us. <coughs> All right, so tonight's episode is a profile of Joan Feynman. We'll be back in 8.3 seconds. Hey, Scott. Hi, Scott. Thanks for joining us. Happy 13th to you as well. Last week, we shared some information about Richard P. Feynman. In this episode, we'll hear about his sister, Joan Feynman. Joan was an American astrophysicist. She made contributions to the study of solar wind particles and fields, sun-earth relations, and magnetospheric physics. In particular, Feynman was known for developing an understanding of the origin of auroras. She was also known for creating a model that predicts the number of high-energy particles likely to hit a spacecraft over its lifetime and for uncovering a method for predicting sunspot cycles. That's exciting stuff. And she had her fingers in a lot of pies too, didn't she? Tell yeah. us more, Jeff. Okay. Um, here, let me get to there. Um, it had a hard time tracking down good information on Joan because almost all of the articles that I found were Joan, uh, Richard's sister. I mean, that was pretty much most of what I found. There are bits and pieces like in here, it talks about her early life, which is nice in the wiki. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, her career, they get into a little bit of her career, just basically hit the highlights of it. And it's weird because I didn't actually hear about her before, but that picture just below there, mm -hmm. I recognize that. And I don't know where from because we watch a lot of the science mm -hmm. discovery kind of programs. So it's quite possible that I remember seeing that image of her from one mm -hmm. of those at some point. So, yeah, yeah I didn't really know her, but uh, certainly knew that picture. I recognized it. Yeah, she um, um, basically showed the effects of coronal mass ejections. Oh, right. And, um, and geomagnetic storms. Be because she got an interested her her brother got her interested in auroras and she learned yeah. that you know she figured out that the auroras were um the interaction of the solar wind with our magnetic field and, and that's that, pretty important stuff because a coronal mass <clears throat> injection can take out our electric grid i mean mm -hmm. <laughs> and her um a lot of her studies were on like how much stuff is actually headed our way. Ah, okay. And as you mentioned in the, early in the wiki article, they talk about figuring out how much radiation you're getting from the solar wind on mm. the spaceship. Mm -hmm. But um, later in her career, we're talking the 90s, she was looking at climate change um, mm. by um, transient solar events. Mm how the sun's activity going up and down affected our climate. It's 11 year cycle or something else? 11 or 22. I think there's a 22 year super cycle, but yeah, they, they don't actually get into that in this article. Okay. Just that there is a, a link and she was studying it. Okay. That's why I'm not really thrilled with 
this article. You know, it does talk about her awards, um, twice elected mm. secretary of the solar and interplanetary physics section mm. of the American Geophysical Union. 2002, she was named one of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's elite senior science, research scientists. In 2000, she was awarded NASA's Exceptional Achievement Medal. That's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And um, one daughter, two sons. Um, and um, and that's pretty much the wiki article, which is a little bit short. And like I said, a lot of these are their articles don't get much more detailed than that. Um, and talk about her and her brother, um, American Phys Advanced Physics, um, has a little bit more detail, um, but not not a lot. Um, Syracuse University, she worked there briefly. And so they, they talk about her a bit, mostly about what she did when she was there. Mm -hmm. And this is a short article, Sun Earth Day. And mm. again, it's all stuff that you've seen in the other things. The best article that I saw was, um, oh, not this one, um, was this one. And this is the- Where's that from? FindingAda.com. Oh, about Ada Lovelace, okay. It's Ada Lovelace Day. Hmm. Yeah, that was recently. Mm -hmm. But that's the website, is FindingAda.com. Hmm. Interesting. In fact, I'm going to share that link right now. Oh, good. Is that a lot about, about a lot of women there, or what's the... I didn't really dig into that. Okay, because um, Ada Lovelace was um, a computer. Mm-hmm. She did computer. Well, I, would, it, I would imagine that it focuses on women in okay. various fields. All right. But, okay. It's not just Ada Lovelace. Right. Okay. I haven't seen this one yet. And found Thanks a bunch sharing. of YouTube videos from um, basically 18 videos here. It looks like it's from a single interview. Mm. Um, so I'll post that link too. Looks like they broke them up to less than 10 minutes. Yep. So. You can watch them pretty easily. Yeah. Sometimes so, that's a little bit better than trying to slog through a whole big hour long thing or more. Yeah. So I'll, I'll post those, but I want to go back to this Ada Lovelace Day article that goes into a lot of detail about her life and the things that she did. Hmm. This is the best article that I found for Ada Lovelace. Cool. You mean... Or for Joan Feynman. Joan Feynman, yes. Talking about one. <laughs> Trying to keep it sorted. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Basically, her mother conv was convinced that women can't do science because their brains aren't made for it. Uh huh. Um, this is what she told her eight year old, eight -year -old daughter. <sighs> now, her father was very interested in everything. Mm. He was, he did not go to college like most people. I, I don't even know if he. Oh, what does Cliff say? Uh, Cliff says, most likely they didn't promote her as a female in the days back then. Like a lot of other women, credit was mostly male. Yep. We do see that a lot. It's true. And it happened a bit in her in her ah, um, circumstances, okay. too. All right. But, um, you know, her, her father may not have even done high school. We don't, they don't mention that. But he was always interested in everything. Right. Yeah. He was. He was intelligent, certainly. And mm -hmm. We kind of knew that from the Richard Feynman um, right episode. But yeah, right. he didn't have a lot of education. Right. And since Richard was nine years older than her, he actually encouraged her a lot in science. So mm -hmm. this part of the two of them, you know, this is where most of the other websites don't go beyond. Um, but you know, so he did encourage her, mm -hmm. he'd give her math problems to do and, um, and she'd finish them. Even when he went off to college, they'd, um, mail a work, a project book back and forth where he'd write problems and she'd send them back. Oh yeah. Okay. Interesting. In fact, once she graduated and was interested in aur auroras, um, she struck a deal with Richard 
Aurora's were her, <laughs> were hers. Richard um, could have the whole rest of the universe, <laughs> but Aurora's were hers. Yeah, you were telling me this beforehand. She yeah. had some problem and wanted to share, and mm -hmm. wait a minute. <laughs> So if I share it, he'll solve it before I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, and, and he, he agreed, he, he agreed. stuck to it. Yeah. He was actually offered a, a job in, uh, um, in Alaska. Oh, <laughs> looking at Aurora's and what they do to communications. Mm. And he didn't take it. Did he recommend his sister? <laughs> they don't say that. Oh, okay. Just that he, because that looked it. like a, cold place in that picture so. mm -hmm. interesting yeah um yeah um but the whole um you, women can't do science because their brains aren't made for it um eight-year-old girl says she says i remember sitting in a chair and weeping Aww. but her father and her brother really encouraged her um i understand <laughs> yeah. And she says, to me, Madame Curie was a mythical figure, oh, not a real person whom you could strive to emulate. Oh, she absolutely was real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Still the only person to have won two Nobel Prizes in science. Mm -hmm. There are others who have won two Nobel Prizes, but none of them in science. And that's mm -hmm. why she's so important and, mm -hmm. and well remembered. Yep. And, um, Lucille's damaging misconceptions would have a lasting negative effect on her daughter. And you can see it throughout the article that it does crop up every once in a while. Mm. It was devastating to be told that all of my dreams were impossible, says Joan. I've doubted my abilities ever since. Mm. Um, well, on the other hand, it would have been encouraged for Richard by, yeah. by both parents, probably. Mm -hmm. Although not, that doesn't always happen with families. It was. Um, yeah. He... Um, Jones, even before Richard was born in 1918, Jones' father, Melville, had confidently predicted to her mother that the boy was going to be a scientist. Okay. Probably because I'm assuming that the father had wanted to be a scientist oh. and just could never be one. That makes a lot of sense. Because he was so interested in everything. Yeah. And back then, you could be a scientist of everything because, mm. you know, there was so lo little known about everything. Yeah, we didn't like in have the all these 30s. Yeah. different specialties yeah. that I'm expecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, nowadays you have a specialist in the big toenail of the right foot. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I, I, I've read about it. I was like, jeez, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like too specialized, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um. Dick was given every opportunity in the family for science, every encouragement. But then Richard always um, encouraged her. Um, That's cool. And even this part where it's talking about her and Richard, they go into more detail than any of the other articles. Mm. So whoever did this did a lot of interviewing, a lot of research. Mm -hmm. So I really like this finding ada.com. And I might have to look at other articles that that they have on there. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's important and, and interesting to note that he was a big part of her life. But mm -hmm. it's a little bit sad that there's there's so much you mm -hmm. know, that comes back to him mm -hmm. instead of her and an article about her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the time Joan was born, nine years after him, Richard was eager in, to enthuse his long-awaited sibling <laughs> with his excitement about the potential of science. So she never really stood a chance, really. <laughs> yeah, at nine. Mm -hmm. Nine months would have been, felt like a long time. Mm -hmm. By the time she was five, Richard, or Riddy as she called him, hired at me as his lab assistant right. for four cents a week. For that four cents, I was expected to put my finger in a spark gap for the amusement of his friends. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> what? Ma, well, you know, brothers. Yes. Hey, let's see if she'll do it again. Hey, she actually still does it. Yeah. <laughs> keep, keep delivering the four cents, buddy. 
Uh, Cliff comes on and says, uh, sort of hate that phrase, woman can't do science. Yep. It doesn't matter what you are or disability. Yep. Yep. If you've got the, the mind for it, mm -hmm. you can do it. Not everybody does. Some people are into sports mm -hmm. and some people are into racing cars and, well, you know, it's sort of whatever your thing is. <laughs> no one group and is, no, no one group has everyone of the same group be the same. I mean, yeah. you can't say that about any group. Pick any group and everyone's different. I agree with you, Cliff. Scott says it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And fortunately for the world, we are all different because... Mm -hmm. Can you imagine all of us being exactly the same? We'd never get anything done. We might actually be poof, gone as a species. Well, yeah. As soon as we encountered something yeah. that we couldn't handle, That's if it. we didn't have it's Like the panda can only eat one kind of, um, of a, what is it? Bamboo. Yeah, that stuff. Well, isn't, um, that, isn't that a deal? Koala, with the, oh, the koala, koalas. The koala, yeah. The, the pandas are actually very picky about what they eat, too. Yeah, you, you don't want that that much mm -hmm. specialization, I mm -hmm. guess. Again, it's... yeah. Um, oh, and here's one that'll come in later. Melville was enormously interested. That's her father in science. Like most people at the time, he didn't go to college, but he read everything he could get his hands on. Mm. Remembers Joan when. She was still quite young. He read her a book on continental drift <laughs> as a bedtime story. <laughs> Decades before it was proved, the author, scientist Alfred Wagner, Wagner um, mm -hmm. described his radical idea that the continents moved and were not fixed and static. <laughs> My father had a very good intuitive understanding of things, says mm. Joan. He just loved science, and that wore off on Richard and I. <laughs> How cool is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So they did a lot of experiments. Um, and um, Richard's flair, flair, you can see Richard's leanings on be, being a teacher here. Because mm. his flair on demonstrating and explaining things in a, in a way that infected others with his love of science was forged on Joan. I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just reading oh. so, the part of it. He would tell her things such as the fact that the family dog, the waffle iron, and even Joan herself were all made out of atoms. Mm -hmm. Nice. The Feynman family home was always full of love and laughter. Lucille believed that life was difficult. And the thing that made it tolerable was an ability to look at it as funny and be able to laugh. Yeah, seems like a good idea. Richard and Lucille, her brother and her mother, mm -hmm. would often joke around to make Joan and Melville laugh. We would plead with them, stop, stop, <laughs> we can't eat, says Joan. <laughs> they would continue until I fall off the floor laughing. Oh, jeez. That was the only thing that would make them stop. So, um, and then the path of Joan's life would be changed significantly one night when Richard woke her up and told mm. her to get dressed and follow him out into the street. Mm -hmm. He took her away from the house and the street lights and out onto a wide golf course nearby with a big dark sky above them. And she says, I can still remember in my mind's eye, the green lights dancing in the sky. <laughs> she recalls, um, the flickering of Northern lights, Richard let her outside to witness. Mm. He told me that it was an aurora, and no one, no one knew what caused it exactly. And she found out. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. In that moment, she was hooked. Um, but, you know, doubts about her ability in science still remained. Um, but her brother made a deal with her that while away at the Massachusetts Institute of T Technology, studying for a specialist degree, he would answer any science question she sent him. <laughs> yeah, for quite a while, we had a notebook which went back and forth, and he sent me problems in maths, and I sent him the answer. Um, and he, For her 14th birthday, he gave her the astronomy, the book Astronomy by Robert Horace Baker. 
it was a book people studied at college. 14, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he passed my name. He, he pasted my name in, in it. So I was so excited. Nice. Somewhat daunted by the book, Jane wrote to Richard to ask how she should read it. <laughs> now, this is interesting. He replied that she should start from the beginning and read until she didn't understand. And then start from the beginning again. And each time she would get further. Nice. So I did. And I got a little bit further each time. Then one day, there was a figure in the book of a spectrum. And underneath it, it said, the relative strength of the magnesium plus absorption line at you know, 4481 angstroms of stellar atmospheres from the work of Cecilia Payne Gaspachkin. Gaspachkin. <laughs> the caption was a revel revelation to Joan. Cecilia was a woman's name. And the hyphenated family name indicated that she was married. It was proof that a married woman was capable of doing science. <laughs> With one page turn the, and the discovery of Cecilia's work, Joan's notion of becoming a scientist was restored. Yay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, Cliff has a comment. I have dyslexia, can't spell or write essays and stuff, but my science forced my forced me to learn to get around it over many years computers helped mm -hmm. yes it's amazing what computers can help us with these mm -hmm. days kind of cool yeah. and, it, and it happened pretty fast i mean my grandmother she lived in in, the, in her one lifespan she grew up on a farm with like 12 siblings and they did all the work themselves they had horse and carriage and then she lived long enough to see the space shuttle launching so mm -hmm. that's a lot in mm -hmm. one one single lifetime <laughs> mm -hmm. it's really amazing what else you got there jeff oh i'm only a third of the way through this sucker oh wow that's good yeah. oh, I can't there's a lot it. of really good detail in here mm -hmm. and i won't hit on all of it i just wanted to get into where she came from you know and she did end up going to oberlin college which is in Ohio. Yep. Yes, it is in Ohio. <laughs> well, it's just interesting to me that there's, just, there's these connections because mm -hmm. they have her on, um, you know, on the Wikipedia page, you know, they have born in and, and died in. She actually died in this area, right, where we are now. And she went to college at Oberlin. So I was like, wow, that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. I mean, you know, when something ties in like that for you, it's sort of, I don't know if it means more or it piques your interest mm -hmm. more. So, yeah, I've just Maybe noticed that it. so many people are from Ohio. <laughs> don't start. Keep moving. Keep moving. You got to yeah. show it. You got to show to do here. Someone had to fly into space to get as far away from Ohio as he could get. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. What else you got? I'm lucky that Dawn's not here. Dawn is in Texas. Mm -hmm. She's getting ready for the eclipse tomorrow. Yep. Okay. Um, Rich, here, here's just a little bit more on that time period when she was wondering about herself. Richard wrote back to her telling her not to, not to aim for the bottom, but for the top, adding, if you don't make it to the top, then you'll still be a better scientist than if you hadn't. Yep. That's that's wise advice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. Um, and in Oberlin, she met, um, and you know, a guy who had gotten out of the army because this was mm. right after um, World War II, or mm. actually still, maybe still during it. No, I think it was out after. You got a year there. Like, wow. um, well, they graduated in forty-eight. Oh, so probably World War II. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was definitely World War II, but whether he was out just because his tour was up or because the war was over, I don't know. Okay. Um, but um, they got married and graduated in, in 48. I think they graduated and then got married. Um, but they were both in physics. Uh-huh. Um, but then... That's, that's interesting because, of course, we, we remember about Richard. He was there was a rule he couldn't get married until he graduated oh and here we got a 
Or do you guys get to see the eclipse? Yes, we will see the eclipse. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that more in a minute, Cliff. Yeah. And um, so um, during her doctoral thesis, Joan found out that she preferred theoretical to experimental physics, hmm. leaving her two fields to choose, general relativity or solid state physics. Pondering her choices, she consulted professors, but once more a woman in the male-dominated field, she encountered attitudes that were like, um, should do her PhD research on cobwebs because she would encounter them while cleaning. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Didn't take the advice. She says, I was frightened of general relativity, she admits, but I wasn't in love with solid-state physics either. Mm-hmm. Mm. Her husband was also seeking a thesis subject, but um, had actually changed from physics to anthropology mm. as a post-grad. Mm -hmm. And they ended up going to Guatemala where she did some stuff, but she wasn't really happy there. Oh. Um, returned to the U.S. Um, they continued with their Ph.D. research. She said, I'd missed my physics. And it was good to get back to it. Um, Sputnik 1 launched, mm. and the space era, era appeared. She says, you can make a new discovery by studying the data from space. It was mm. exciting as could be. Oh, yeah. Um, she had her, she, but first she had a thesis in solid state physics to finish. She picked solid state physics after all. Interesting. Yeah, like I said, like, you know, like she said, she, she was intimidated by um, uh, okay. relativity. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize, well, solid state physics can go both ways, I guess. Well, solid state physics is basically Newtonian physics, as we know, not relativity. Okay. All right. I'm um, thinking, anyway. Yeah. No, <laughs> I I know. It's a to weird me, solid name. solid state is something else. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a weird name for it, but was probably the name for it at the time. Oh, okay. Um, but completing her, her thesis in 1958, mm. um, received her doctorate alongside her husband. Hers in physics, his in anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> having two people graduate, a married couple to graduate, both with PhDs, was big news. So that's cool. Yeah, they had a photo with them both <laughs> in their caps and gowns. Um, <laughs> So she was not warned away from getting married, mm -hmm. like her brother was. Interesting. Yeah. Um, had a hard time finding physics jobs mm. um, because um, there was a men's section and a women's section. And men's section had men's jobs, women's section had women's job. Like of the for paper? job postings. Yeah, for in okay. the paper, for job postings. Wow. Yeah, I'd never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, threw herself into homework, but what wasn't happy with it. Um, but then, after three years away from science, to, to, and unsure anyone would hire her, Joan went to visit Lamont Observatory, Col Columbia University Ge Geophysical Geological Laboratory only 20 miles from her home. I told them I had a PhD in physics and would like a job. <laughs> the research there was all in geophysics. Mm. And to her complete surprise and delight, three research professors offered her jobs. Nice. There was a project on, on the moon quakes, one on tektites, the glass-like objects formed by the impact of meteorites, mm -hmm. and one on rapid variations of the Earth's magnetic field, recalls Joan. Mm. Okay. And so starting to see how this is going to work. Yeah. <laughs> Working half days with mm. child care, mm. you, have, you know, commitments. She opted to study magnetic field, Earth's magnetic field. Um, the subject was known as geomagnetics. Mm. Um, in the early 60s, little was known about how this, how the solar wind emanating from the sun interacted with our magnetosphere. And 
She says, Lamont was a great place to work. In fact, one of the other profiles that we did, the guy works for Lamont. Oh, do you remember who? Um, no, it was one that I did, though. Hmm. Um, okay. But, um, they ended up firing him because he wasn't actually working for them. You know, after years of just being on the books, and they called him to, in back to that state to actually teach a class, and he, he wouldn't, and they fired him. Hmm. But um, but Lamont was a great place to work. They do fundamental science. Cool. She still remembers a colleague rushing in excitedly <laughs> one day to share the news that the sample cores collected at the by the Lamont Observatory research ship drilling in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean had provided a great discovery. The content, the continents are moving, he declared. <laughs> Recalling her bedtime stories about continental drift read to her by her father all those years before, she replied, when did they stop? It's <laughs> oh, fascinating because here's someone who's like, it's a discovery. And she goes, okay, <laughs> yeah. But that was thanks to her father reading, mm -hmm. reading to her. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> and she actually was actually able to measure um, the, the Earth's magnetosphere and figure out the shape of it using measurements made by spacecraft launched to police the nuclear test ban treaty. Wow. So that shape that we see when they show those pictures of you know how it bows around mm -hmm. the earth and, and has the tail yeah that's yeah. due to her work yes because of, wow. apparently before that they shot it they thought it was um well they thought it was um enclosed in a tear shaped bubble which is what mm. you usually see what well, kind but of looks like a tear shape instead had a long tail a long wide tail oh i see okay on the opposite side of the sun so instead of mm -hmm. coming down to a narrow point, you know, relatively mm -hmm. soon, like a tear, like a um, yeah. teardrop, yeah, it, you know, long streamer out mm -hmm. behind, mm -hmm. and okay. um, so you know, a bit about so the pre kind of predictions weren't too far off. Oh, Jamie says, uh, delightful stories of real life in the forties and fifties. I appreciate this profile series. Thanks so much, guys. Oh, you're very welcome, yeah. Jamie. And we always learn a tremendous amount when we look into these people. This article in particular. Um, yeah, I really I like this article. And like I said, I'm going to look on the site for more articles because. Cool. Yeah, there's probably something about Ada Lovely. So. I, well, given the fact that it's findingada.com, <laughs> yeah. I would think so. Yeah, um, that should be good too. Yeah. Um, and then she ended up having a question about auroras and she found the work, you know, basically because her. Her work with, um, in their letter to Aurora's, mm. because that's again solar wind, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, it's so, related. So she found this work wonderful. Her immediate reaction was to tell her brother, who'd first introduced her to these beautiful <laughs> phenomena all those years before. But then, in a second thought, crossed her mind Richard is pretty smart. If I tell him about an interesting problem, He'll find the answer before I do and take all the fun out of it for me. <laughs> so Joan decided to strike a deal with him. I said, look, I don't want us to compete. So let's divide up physics between us. I'll take Aurora's and you take the rest of the universe. And he said, okay. Well, he did get the rest of the universe after all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I should and, hope that's enough. <laughs> and here's the thing. Later on, he's working in um alaska and he gets an offer to work on on um auroras and he refused it that's awesome they don't say whether he he offered the job to the sister or not but I'd be curious to know yeah. someday <laughs> Interesting. um and um in 1963 joe's husband dick was offered a job in california and they moved. Um, she approached the director of Lamont to see if she could continue to work for them from there. So she oh. was a remote worker. Wow. And they said yes. That's pretty early on for yeah that kind of thing. She she broke a lot of ground. Yeah. Well, it was theoretical um, research. And yeah. 
and the, certainly the atmosphere and the sky are everywhere you go. And it's not like they were glued, glued to computers, you know, yeah. and printouts and stuff because they didn't have those yeah. really. It was done by mail and, you know, yeah. stuff like that. Even <laughs> even then they would get their data by mail. So instead of yeah. sending it to them, they sent it to our... fax by then? No. No. Okay. Um, Telegraph certainly, but. Because if early, you needed to get something fast. This is early 60s. They might have had fax machines by then, right? Maybe Joni knows. No, no, not, Janie, sorry. not fax machines. Not fax machines. Um, they had teletypes, which were the modern equivalent of um, of telegraphs. Huh. So instead of going dot, 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 it would transmit characters. Ah. Okay. And, you know, I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was, in ASCII or not, but they was encoded in ons wow. and offs for the characters. ASCII is that old? Wow. Uh, I, that's okay. why I said I don't know. I think ASCII was invented with computers. Yeah. Um, but it, they had some way of encoding characters, and you know they could teletype. Um, what is that? ASCII -I, ASCII. Yeah. ASCII code, and it's uh, uh it does things like what? What's the deal? It gives characters like an asterisk and yeah, eight character, eight bits. Per character okay and then extended as 16 bits per character okay um but that gave them um you know a lot of characters that they could do and 65 was is where um uppercase a starts hmm. the rest of the characters before that are other things they run through the alphabet uppercase runs for the uh, lowercase and then they get into other special characters again after mm -hmm. that. Maybe we'll computer, do a show on that. Computer nerd. Yes. Maybe we'll do a show on that someday. Anybody want to learn about ASCII? Like, deep dive? Hey, Is that a crunchy it, topic? If <laughs> you guys want to know, I can do it. But <laughs> it wasn't all that interesting to me. I don't know. Oh, hello. Oh, hey, uh, Eric. Hello again from Australia. Yeah, hi, Eric. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Okay. Glad you're here. Um. So they settled in California and isolated from her, from the, her peers at Lamont. Um, she sought out the science community in NASA's <laughs> nearby Ames Research Center. Ames, okay. Um, and asked whether she could attend their lectures. So that got her involved in that circle. Mm, nice. Um, she got pregnant with her third kid um, the following year, daughter Susan. So two boys and a daughter. Um, oh, Jamie Scott. Alexander Bain sent first fax machine March 4th, 1955. So hmm. not unlikely, not impossible. Let's put right. it that way, not impossible. I don't think it was a lot of wide things, use. But... but a lot of things were done by fax for mm -hmm. a long time. Thanks, Jamie. That's well, so in cool. Fact, <laughs> in fact, um, I know that some legal stuff just finally weaned oh. themselves off of faxing. <laughs> into email yay um means that some of the companies that i support don't need landlines anymore <laughs> for the stupid faxes that all they get are ads i think doctors still have faxes some of them might um yeah. don't really deal with doctors that much but Got it. Okay. i know that lawyers are f and tax people are finally off of fax machines that's interesting um but um stories that her children say her son Charles um, remembers at age six um, mm. he, he asked her about her job as a scientist she, in response Joan handed him a spoon drop it on the table she said Charles let it fall why did it fall why did it why didn't it float up into the ceiling asked Joan mm -hmm. it had never occurred to Ch Charles that there was a why involved mm. because of gravity she continued a spoon will always fall a hot air balloon will always rise. Joan Charles dropped the spoon again and again until she made him stop. He was six years old. Of course he was six. Going yeah. To. Um, gravity check. <laughs> yeah. The boy had no idea what gravity was, but the idea of why kept rattling around in his head. So I think she made him into a scientist, although they don't really get into that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so she went on with John Spritz spider on the interactions of solar wind with the earth's, earth's magnetic field um mm. led to a discovery about sol storms of solar wind known as coronal mass ejections mm -hmm. 
these bursts of ultra fast move, char, um, moving charged particles have a significant effect on Earth's magnetic fields, often inducing electrical currents that could dis disable satellites and even electronic communications and power systems on the surface of Earth. Yep. So she was, this is where she got involved in that. That's really important. Yeah. Yeah. Su such events were notoriously hard to identify until Jones showed that they could be recognized by an increased amounts of helium in the solar wind. Wow. So, um, mm. but despite um, the significance of Jones' discovery, her research was in jeopardy. The US economy was in recession and NASA's budget was being cut as, as a moonshot Apollo program was winding up. Mm. So, so that's, we're starting to talk 70s here, right? Yeah, late 60s, yeah, early yeah. 70s. In 72, funding for their work was stopped and Joan was suddenly out of a job. Mm. Over the next few months, um, she was struggling to the work of a housewife and mother with her search for another science post. And um, mm. and it wasn't. Um, she went to a rabbi because the mm. her the church was doing you know help job help program, but oh. um, she didn't get any help there. Well, they probably were, wouldn't have science. Well. Rabbi told her to not be selfish and pointed to all the men who were also out of work <laughs> and more deserving than her. Right. Yeah, good luck. Good job, Rabbi. Um, um, but um, yeah, sign of the times. Yeah, I suppose. Still, she, <laughs> she basically ended up crying mm. and you know saying, "I know you want me here." She told him. But I can either be a part-time mama or a full-time <laughs> mad woman. Um, but then she um, connected with the high altitude observatory in Colorado mm. um, that had new data that she was interested in and started her own unpaid re research with them. Jeez. Um, collaborating by telephone. Um, the publication of a series of papers from this work soon led to her being invited mm. to apply for a research position there. She was accepted, and in 73, her <laughs> husband quit his job in California, and the family moved to Boulder, Colorado. Wow, that's pretty progressive, too. Yeah. Moving well, for her job. This yeah. Time. Well, nice. society is, was shifting its, in its attitude toward women, and mm -hmm. changes in civil rights in America meant that women now had to be routinely considered for work by companies and institutions. Ah. So she was granted a staff job. Hmm. Um, but um, but they didn't tell her that it was a staff job. They they let her think that it was temporary for for over a year. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and apparently caused enough stress in their family that um, they separated. Oh. Um, well, Eric has a comment. Any chance you could share any insights regarding red sprites? Ooh, I yeah. like that a lot. We should do a whole episode on stuff like that in yeah. the atmosphere. We don't actually know a whole lot about that yet. Yeah, we know. Well, we know some stuff. I remember reading some stuff about it, but I don't know if that Good was question. just. Thank you. You know was there those discoveries were actually confirmed or not i've seen some pictures mm -hmm. and there's a book i read with some things about the layers of the atmosphere and what's we need more research we need we need to, to go there and, and mm -hmm. learn more so um thanks for that we will check into that for you mm -hmm. and if you come back next week maybe we'll have a little information yeah and we'll see Maybe we'll, we'll do a whole show on it. Yeah. Because we don't we don't know a lot about it either. So yeah, yeah. we've got the next couple episodes already. Yeah, one or two, I think. Penciled out, but yeah. Um thank you for that. Yeah. Uh I'm looking forward to learning more. Yeah, that gives us an idea for a yeah. future episode. Yeah, I mean we could we could look at the whole atmosphere, like mm -hmm. all the different layers, what that's about, what why they might be. I, I don't think well, I don't know, maybe somebody knows out there. If they know, we'll go digging. All righty. What else you got, Jeff? Well, she got a job in um, 
Washington. Um, State or DC? DC. Mm. Um, she accepted an administrative job in the National Science Foundation mm. as a liaison between it and her old employer, the High Altitude Observatory. Mm. Hmm. But, Not really science. But. Yeah. Deprived of her geophysics research and with a family life in tatters, it was very, it was a very unhappy time, mm. you know. Can imagine. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of changes in the yeah. country too. Yeah, then. she she tolerated the job in Washington for three years wow. until she could stand it. She couldn't stand it any longer and quit. That's a long time. And she got a job in Massachusetts um, Air Force Geophysics Lab mm. um, in 1979 under a research contract to Boston College, and she once again was studying solar terrestrial relations. Wow. Um, and her son Charles says she could begin to regard it as a success. <laughs> but, Cliff says yeah. good topic, Sprite. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Cliff. Um, she'd been twice the scientist that her limited dreams had ever allowed her to imagine she could become. Mm -hmm. While also, they use whilst a lot. I'm yes. imagining that this website is British. Oh, maybe, yeah. Um, while also imagine, imagine managing to bring up three children yeah. in the eighties. Wow. Um, okay. They talk about her brother, um, mm. you know, trying to get, trying to get roped into doing that. Um, and he said, no. Um, and word of the story eventually got around and people would come up to Joan at a conference and ask her if it was true. At one meeting, a colleague from UCLA told the gathering that he wanted to publicly thank Richard Feynman for not studying Aurora <laughs> so that we can all have some fun. Yeah, he made a pretty good point. I mean, Richard was so, mm -hmm. so brilliant. And mm -hmm. Anyway, this is about Joe. Let's talk about Joe. Yep. Uh, so still having fun, Joan left the snow of New England to return to California in 85. <laughs> Accepting a position of NASA at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory nice. in Pasadena, um, and that's a, that's close to us too. Actually. Where her brother and family and his family lived. Mm. Um, after a couple of years, she joined a group studying the sun and the solar wind, which I mean, she of course she would, yeah. um, and has been with them ever since. Well, so that's where she ended her career at JPO. Yeah, with nice. yeah. Um, as a member of this group, I got interested in solar activity cycles. Um, the sun exhibits a well-documented 11-year cycle. Yep. Um, where, you know, <laughs> but. Chris, uh, Cliff says, so what's wrong with British? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing except for your random U insertions into. The Wilson. Yeah. You don't really see that much in, in stuff we normally read. Canoe <laughs> We say color, by the way. The Canadians say things like that too. Yes, I know. You can, you can tell a, a little bit about ca Canadian accent when you hear those words. A boot. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, Keep going. Although, actually, Michigan has the same kind of accent. Really? Well, yeah, because oh, interesting. half their TV came from Canada. Oh, I see. Okay. So, you know, it's only natural. In fact, if I go visit... Michigan for too long. I start talking like that too. Oh boy. Um, you know, while at JPL, her dedicated study of coronal mass ejections has also shown that they'd come in groups rather than occurring separately. Mm. And, um, you know, high activity, low activity on the sun. Yep. Um, combining her research with an active membership. The American Geophysical Union, Joan has contributed to the work of a number of significant scientific commissions over her career. Wow. Um, in 74, she was the first woman to be elected as an officer of the AGU. AGU, American um, Geophysical Union? Yeah. Okay. It helped create a committee charged with advancing the fair treatment of women within the geophysics community. She was twice elected secretary of the Union Solar Interplanetary Physics Section. Nice. Yeah. 1990, 
headed for a conference in Soviet Union, stopped off to visit son Charles and his girlfriend in New York. Um, as her plane passed low over Long Island, she stared at, down at the streets and houses below and was filled with an unfamiliar sense of contentment. <laughs> so it took her that long, 1990s, to be happy. <laughs> um, she never found an another man with whom she could fall in love, but apparently she met a guy in Russia um, near the Black Sea. So Sochi um, mm -hmm. near the Black Sea. Um, he'd grown up in Siberia um, and apparently they, they had some fun together. Um, okay. Oh, they didn't get married. It says married yeah. on the... Okay, yeah, 92. Okay. Yep. Um, <laughs> well, because one of their first, quote, dates, unquote, was going swimming at 6 a.m. Okay. In the Black Sea. So, okay. find yourself swimming together in strange times of the day. Um, Cliff says she was a very smart lady, but never got the start she should have. Can you think of the science she could have come up with? My God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you make a really good point. I hadn't thought of that, Cliff. I think she wasn't yeah. any less smart than Richard. No, I her IQ she, was actually one point higher. Right. I think that just though. she was told that she wasn't as smart, yeah. and she believed it. Yeah. Well, it's hard. Yeah. When your um, mother tells you at eight. Yep. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, in the mid two thousands. She um, applied this work to anthropology, co-author it. <laughs> um, oh, study of so, um, solar causes of geomagnetic and climate disturbances. So she co-authored a major paper with Alexander about the history of mankind, in which they postulated that climate stability, which suddenly took place in uh, 10,000 years ago, was a key contribution to the emergence of agriculture globally. Hmm. Um, this theory now forms the basis of a consensus on why such a vital de development in human history did not happen sooner. Hmm. So, yeah. Um, and they... Yeah, she died know, just three years ago. I mean, yeah. it's not that long ago. Yeah. And and she was, what was she, 93? Is that what it said? Yeah, and only about 20 miles from here. Yeah, um, yeah very... Very mm -hmm. close to us. Yeah. So, um, such you know, Arctic oscillation, which is caused by, well, she you know postulates is caused by solar activity. Mm -hmm. um, they discovered that periods of low solar activity with fewer sunspots coincided with major cooling periods in certain mm -hmm. parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Such such a pattern occurred in Europe during the time known as the Little Ice Age between the 16th and 19th centuries, and appears to a lesser extent to be cooling Earth's climate again at the moment. Yeah, we're actually overdue for an ice age. Yeah. Um, about eight years ago, the sun started to do something unexpected, explains Joan, uh, and this is mid 2000s. So that's contemporary with mm -hmm. what she's saying. Um, instead of starting a new 11 year sunspot cycle as usual, the sunspot number became extremely low for an extended length right. of time. I remember that. Yeah, I remember this. I'm we just looking surprised. like an orange disc. Yeah. We were surprised that yeah. what happened to this regular, I mean, it was very regular, this cycle of 11 yeah. years where the sunspots were, you know, mm -hmm. greater and then lesser. Yeah. So the presence of sunspot, the present sunspot cycle began to develop, but it was extremely small. Mm -hmm. And the solar wind was also much more dense. Mm and had a lower magnetic field in it than had been observed before. Well, this is a great article for science stuff, too. So Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Um, and her, her um, strange behavior was helped to confirm a less, lo less well-known um, 90 to 100-year solar mm, cycle. Okay. So it's kind of a cycle within the cycle. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, which, during which time the amplitude of the 11 year sunspot cycle varies. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, it kind of 
does this over time, you know, gets bigger, gets mm, okay. Um, kind of like when you well, how they draw the packet of a photon, which is you know, wiggle, 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 bigger, 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 wiggle, 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 the amplitude thing, okay, yeah. Hmm. Um, that's a photon particle, is that little um wave packet, okay. Um, you'll have to show me sometime, yeah, because I don't. Yeah. I think I've seen that. Yeah. What else you got? So basically, that's about it. Um, it it's um, together with Alexander Joan continues to publish work oh, so on the sun's influence. This must have influence. been written before she died. Yeah. Work on the sun's influence on Earth's climate. And has now authored or co authored more than 150 scientific papers yeah. and edited three scientific books. Despite retiring from the lab in 2004, she continues well, at the time of this article uh, to work there and still goes to her office most days. Wow. How could I retire when the sun is doing such crazy <laughs> things, she says, smiling. <laughs> and there's a li list of, um, ver of a couple of books that she co-authored. Um, cool. The wiki page, which... The good thing about the wiki page is the links on it. Um, and then basically some more, but so this is um, the Lada Lovelace um, site, um, findingada.com has the best article on her. All righty. And, um, and that's the first link you shared in the chat yeah. here. And okay, cool. let's see, did I share the YouTube one yep. with her talks? Yes. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the wiki, of course, just put her name in a search. Yeah. And yep. Um, and yeah, that's that's all. Cool. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um wow, that's pretty exciting. I read a little bit about her when I was doing the research about Richard. Looks like there's more yeah. to get into. Yeah. And like I said, that was the best article that didn't just deal with her as Richard's sister. Mm -hmm. Or Very attributed, cool. you know, all of her stories were stories about Richard, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah, I know there's a, well, it's the like the 100th anniversary of his birthday, which I saw part of that video. And it was her talking about Richard. So interesting on one side, but it's not really about her. I mean, she mentioned some things. That, that they but, did but yeah. yeah but and we've kind of heard about some of those the stories when they were kids and stuff yeah. that's why i like that link about that interview with her because yeah. it's just basically her good good all right yeah. so anything else for me for that no nope, that's all. uh leave us your comments if you have more and i'm going to go into the stellar events this week oh, oh. i got one from Janie. Love learning about these profiles. Fun, educational, and entertaining. Grateful for some changes toward equality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what have we lost? That anyway, <laughs> you you get the idea. Right. Yeah. Well. Well, fortunately, there were a number of discoveries made by women that are published. They were just published by men. Um, yeah. You know, but at least the stuff got out there. Yeah. All right, so some stellar events this week, and we're talking October 13th through the 20th. Uh, of course, the 13th is today, and the moon is on the equator tomorrow. <laughs> it's a really busy day. I got four things to tell you about. Um, the new moon is one of them, and there's an annular eclipse of the sun. I want to caution you to always protect your eyes. Never look directly at the sun, which is our nearest star. All right, so we're going to at the stage. I'm going to share this. With you briefly let's make it big uh and then because um this annular eclipse it's going to be visible from uh, parts of oregon california nevada utah arizona new mexico and texas uh it's a partial eclipse elsewhere in north america and there's some good sites out there uh here's a couple of them i want to tell you about of course nasa's always got really good stuff and it's beautiful look at this when and where and you've got a nice map um and we can add these to the chat as well um it's basically and i'm gonna zoom out a little bit because you can kind of see the the entire footprint i found these controls a little bit weird to um to handle but i did like this map here you can kind of see where 
I would call it the footprint of totality will be coming through and they're going to be well by totality is still an annular totality right the, right right the moon's yes. a little bit farther out so we're not it's not covering the sun completely right yeah it's not quite in the right spot to be a total uh eclipse of the sun right. but this will give you the kind of the path of the most right eclipsed. And, and we're outside it so we're going to end yep. up with an arc yeah we'll have about 70 percent though because we're not that far away from this mm -hmm. totality path so the farther away you get the smaller it will be and i i have another graphic that demonstrates that even better so there's the overall picture of where mm -hmm. and then uh, like i said these these were kind of weird to work with i thought and this kind of looks at the the different path of the eclipse and then you know oh. 80 70 60 50 yeah i saw that uh then they talk about where it goes in um uh, central america and i think parts of south america even yeah there we go all right so we'll put that into the chat uh, a table about when oh and i like this one over here because uh, it actually gives you a countdown we're talking about 11 hours 50 minutes and 40 Nope, it's updated. 10 hours, 2 minutes, and 28 seconds. <laughs> because I looked at it, it updated. All right, and of course, this is from um, Time and Date, which is an excellent site for all kinds of different things. They give you a nice little um, uh, animated graphic of what you're going to see. That's always fun to look at, I think. And it's kind of speeded up. Uh, but that's not the true image of it. That's going to happen um, in 10 hours <laughs> in a bit. Uh, but they do give a nice big map of the uh, where it is and how it looks on the, the globe, that kind of thing. So there's some really good information out there. Uh, just wanted to make a quick, uh, quick mention of that so that if you are in any of these areas, you uh, have a chance to go and look. All right, so <laughs> that's just two for that date. Um, oh, Let's get back to us. Uh, that's just two for that date. So we're going to talk about the moon as an ascending note as well. Mercury and the moon are in conjunction also on the 14th. October 15th, Mars and the moon are in conjunction. October 19th, Mercury is at superior conjunction. October 20th this is the Friday night show. I'll do a demonstration of a tool we just learned about recently. I realized something. I didn't tell you when to go and look. For us in California, it's really early, like 8 o'clock in the morning if you start looking you will see the whole thing. And if you're in other parts of the country, it goes like eight, nine, 10, 11 on the East coast kind of time frame. So yeah. And, uh, let me grab those sites, the links for those sites and add them to how's that. All right. I'll put the last one first. Oh, and Cliff says, Oh, it goes over Roswell. <laughs> I wake up the aliens. <laughs> Maybe pity. You don't get to see it. Well, we'll see it. Um, we'll just won't see it be a total ring we'll see an arc yeah we won't see totality we'll have 70 percent coverage is what uh -huh. they're saying and i'm going to go to um the more park city library and support them uh for their eclipse event uh -huh. all right let's see what else we got here that's you oh last call to australia you still have time to name our rover or in this case name your rover because it's in australia um the entries close October 20th, 2023. The winner will be announced on December 6th, 2023. And the chosen name will be engraved on the Australian made rover that will head to the moon by as early as 2026. That's actually pretty cool because I don't think Australia has ever sent anything to the moon. Mm -mm. Let us know. All right. So if you or someone you know has done something interesting involving space exploration, science, astronomy like that, we'd love to share a live. Join us again next Friday, which is October 20th. I will do a demonstration of ESA Sky. ESA Sky. That's how I would say it. But I guess, anyway, we heard about it, uh, this interesting tool uh, two, three weeks ago from uh, while listening to Anton Petrov. Uh -huh. He has a YouTube channel, does a daily science, uh, fairly crunchy talk. Uh, and uh, thanks to Don for encouraging us to tune into his show. I had seen a random episode here and there, but we did start to watch them fairly regularly lately and mm -hmm. uh, really very much enjoying it. He's, uh, he's really, really great. Very much delves into, no, never. <laughs> what does that mean, Cliff? Yeah. Oh, well, oh, the, 
Um, he's referring to the sending stuff to the moon. Oh, never. Okay, yes. Right. I didn't think you had sent anything to the moon yet, so this will be a first for Australia. Yay. Yay. Join the space exploration clan. <laughs> All right, so tonight's trivia question, what does ESA stand for? Join us again next week. We'll answer that, and we'll see if you got it right. Uh, let's do a shout-out to Cliff and Jamie. Thanks so much for being here with us. And Eric and Scott Stop. was here. We missed Dawn. Sorry about that. But she's in Texas. She is looking for that eclipse tomorrow morning, too. Uh -huh. Did I miss anybody? I think I got uh, you Yeah, off. I think you got them. Thank you so much, folks. We really appreciate you being here. It just makes the show much, much better uh -huh. with you here with us. All right. Have a great week. Okay. We'll see you next Friday. Good night. Good night. Folks.